Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this is going to be an edit from the uh, Joint House Inquiry into the 9 11 attacks. Senator Evan Barr is interviewing counterterrorism uh, director Kofer Black. Let's see what they have to say. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I have five minutes. I have five questions, so I'll try and move uh, quickly. And I'd be grateful to uh, to you if you could do the same, uh, Mr. Black. Uh, most of these questions uh, are for you. Uh, as you stated, you were the head of CTC until uh, I think about four months ago. Yes, sir. And um, in your prepared testimony, you had indicated that in, before 9/11 of last year, Hezbollah had really been perceived as probably the greatest uh, terrorist threat. Uh, the question I have for you is, could you give us the, as of the date that you left CTC, can you give us the hierarchy of priorities? I assume Al-Qaeda was number one by that point. Yes, sir. I, I, I have to apologize if I misspoke. I didn't mean it like that. I said, I was trying to convey the sense that there was not only Al-Qaeda, there was Hezbollah. And up until 9-11, Hezbollah had killed more Americans. Correct. So I'm not so saying if, they were As ahead. of the date you left, it would have been Al-Qaeda, presumably, would have been number Al one. Al-Qaeda would then... have been first. It, now that he's what he's saying is not wrong. So Hezbollah during the late seventies, early eighties was considered the number one terrorist threat to the United States uh, abroad, not inside the United States. And as you could see, that Hezbollah is much different than say Hamas or Al Qaeda, whereas Hezbollah is a Shia-oriented paramilitary uh, political organization, as opposed to Al Qaeda or Hamas which is Salafi oriented. Now these are different religions uh, and different tenets regarding both sects and different uh, paradigms within those religions of Shia and Sunni of Islam. But in terms of recency, Al Qaeda uh, has been the more prescient threat than Hezbollah. Hezbollah hasn't really been a threat uh, to the United States uh, in the in the 1990s, in fact, 1990s, it was the growing threat of Salafism, which is uh, primarily brought about by the Gulf region, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates. Um, Hezbollah is originating out of Lebanon. Uh, they're considered linked with Iran, Syria. Uh, so they're basically. This is basically a. Uh, a regional um, regional problem that is uh, put at the forefront by the lobbies of Israel and Saudi Arabia, who consider Iran and Lebanon a greater threat than, say, Saudi Arabia, uh, which creates all these, you know, terrorist groups that are uh, always against the United States and Western interests for religious reasons as what the State Department would say. Nevertheless, what Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah have in something in common is that it has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with U.S. foreign policy. And that's where the real problem is. That's the exogenesis of this problem, not just with 9-11, not with just 1993 World Trade Center bombing, but with just about every single terrorist act against the U.S. and their interests, whether it's abroad or inside the United States. It's never about religion or women wearing short skirts or the freedom to vote, nothing to do with it. Because if you look at the problem, the problem is foreign policy. And if Americans say, hey, why are they attacking us? Why are they hate us so much? What are we doing wrong? And we start concentrating on foreign policy and there's enough public outcry from both the left and right and act as a whole unit. Well, guess what? We might make some changes and that's not what Israel and Saudi Arabia and the US want. This, um... This is a list of particularly, what I'd rather do is give you the criteria. Essentially, it makes it easier. The highest criteria for us are terrorist groups that say they want to kill us, have the capability to kill us, and have killed us in, okay. in, in continuous. So essentially, if you look at that, that would be the highest. The greatest threat to the United States would be like Al-Qaeda. Let me, let me cut to the chase. Uh, Please. I was sort of laying a predicate there. Uh, as of uh, May, when you left, where would Iraq have been on the uh, priority list of terrorist threats to our country? Um, it's a good question, but it's sort of the wrong shop. Um, that is a state sort of terrorism. I deal with the 
the outgrowth of that. I don't okay. specifically address countries. Well, we're now in the business of right analyzing that. the nexus between mm -hmm. state sponsorship and other terrorist organizations. But in any event, with other questions, I'll just move on. That obviously is a question of some moment. Uh, yes, right it now. is. I, I, I don't think it would be a good idea, for, certainly for me, to address that here. Uh, the question of the use of lethal force, we can't get into that in any uh, detail here. Uh, but uh, as you know, there's a prohibition against that. Occasionally, the chief executive of the country can uh, authorize certain activities that don't involve that, but might involve that. The lawyers get involved, et cetera, et cetera. And understandably, there's a reluctance on the part of uh, your former shop to read too much into those kind of things. Is it your opinion that we should revisit the policy and consider revoking the prohibition against the use of lethal force? In my view? Yes. Yes. Now, of course, he's going to say uh, yes. Black, you so let me just stop right there. Of course, he's going to say yes, because before 9-11, there was a lot of restrictions on the CIA not to use extrajudicial force, deadly force, as a means of being the primary uh, implementation of how to settle a problem. Now, during the church committee hearings of 1977-78, there was a lot of restrictions on the CIA because they were using extrajudicial killings in terms of in, when they committed espionage and spying on countries and killing off dissidents and people they considered a threat to U.S. and their interests. And so this brought to light a lot of the dark arts that the CIA was into during the 1960s and 70s. And it was brought to light during the Frank Church Committee hearings. And so throughout the 1980s and early 90s, the CIA basically just went into the shadows, so to speak, to get out of the public light. Um, but after 9-11, as Kofa Black would later infamously say in the Joint House inquiries, well, the gloves came off. And basically, everybody supported, uh, you know, revenge. Uh, and if the CIA had to go into um, the, you know, dark arts that they used to in the 60s, 70s, well, then so be it, as long as the threat's neutralized. Well, guess what? We are now 21 years after 9-11 attacks, and they have become... Uh, even probably worse than they were uh, 40, uh, 40, 50 years ago. You mentioned uh, during your testimony that laws and rule. You, you mentioned at least one occurrence where uh, laws and rules against contaminating cr criminal investigation with intelligence information sort of hampered uh, the cooperation between yourselves and the, and the FBI. Could you give us uh, a list or if not a list, at least your the top examples of the, the laws and the rules that you think we should take a, a look at to perhaps uh, improve uh, to make your job and the job of the FBI easier in terms of uh, discharging your duties in terms of protecting the country. Um, I'm unprepared to answer that question. I'd have to research and get back to you. Well, I would appreciate it if you would, sure. because uh, uh, obviously looking forward, we all want to examine those things that you view or your yes, colleagues in the FBI that. view as impediments and. Right. Uh, look for ways that we can uh, address those impediments to, to mm -hmm. better accomplish the mission that we all uh, all share here. Mm -hmm. So if you would yes, do sir. that, I would I appreciate certainly it. do that. Uh, my next question uh, deals with, um, and I think uh, Mr. Watson has addressed this, and I apologize, Mr. Black, if you've addressed this as well, uh, about one of the big picture issues we have to address is not only uh, whether we should have some systemic changes in terms of the management of intelligence uh, globally, but whether we should follow the British example and the example of other countries in terms of having a separate domestic intelligence mm -hmm. capability. Uh, and I think Mr. Watson spoke that things have changed in his view since the 70s and the 80s. It's a little bit different now. Uh, do you have an opinion about that? Whether we should uh, adopt the British model, the Israeli model, some others, uh, or whether we should try and work within the current structure to meet that uh, meet that responsibility. Mm. Um, I would have to look at it in some detail with, for a definitive answer. One could go either way, but the FBI, the FBI um, is positioned with exceptionally good people. Um, uh, they can certainly do this job. What it requires is a different sort of training, different sort of mindset. And I'm sure they're up to it and can be done. If they can't, then of course there's a problem. But I have every confidence that they can. It, re it uh, requires looking at problems in a different way as opposed to law enforcement. It is intelligence collection and operations. That's one of the and big big picture questions that we have to answer. I'm down to uh, my last mm -hmm. question. I can sneak one in here. Uh, uh, hum it's been my impression since joining the committee that uh, we're still suffering the uh, 
after effects of the 60s and the 70s and really a withdrawal from many areas of human intelligence, at least in the aggressive sense uh, abroad. Mm. We're attempting to reconstitute that, uh, but aren't quite uh, where we need to be yet. And as a result of that, we're more reliant upon some of our allies who have the right assets in the right places. Uh, Mr. Black, how long, if I'm correct, first of all, am I correct? And if so, how long will we be uh, overly reliant upon others for that kind of capability? How long will it take us to re we can be uh, more independent in terms of protecting our country. Well, I think what a question. So, first of all, if the intelligence services haven't been capable of protecting the United States, and we are in what is this, 2003? Well, then the entire apparatus is a failure. Now, with 9 11, it was an abject failure. Now, here's the difference. Was it a failure that was allowed to happen? Or was it a failure due to malfeasance and human error? I would say it's a mixture of both. And I can make a great argument that 9-11 could have been prevented had the CIA actually not withheld, intentionally withheld information from the FBI and the State Department, as well as the NSA, intentionally withhold, well, that we know of, uh, intentionally withholding from the CIA and the FBI and State Department about information relating to certain people, inside, Al Qaeda operatives inside the United States, and had they informed the FBI and monitored these people, well, they could have stopped 9-11 from even happening. Now, you have agencies like the CIA who are going to, and they already have in 2003, went before a review board and asked for more money about getting more employees and a bigger budget to do their job correctly. You know, in the in the weeks after 9-11, the first thing the CIA did was talk with George Bush in a uh, principal's meeting and then ask for uh, certain restrictions to be loosened. And they got that. And the first thing they did was make a kill list about who to kill. And right there should have been a big red flag right there off the bat. The NSA would later peak Bush's ear and under director Michael Hayden, they basically got an unlimited budget to conduct wireless wiretapping of not just foreigners, but American civilians. And this was extrapolated under the Obama administration by having phone service providers like Verizon give metadata, civilians' metadata, to the NSA without a warrant. Now, right there, that's treason. And if you look up or Google room 641A, uh, which was a room that was uh, based in a uh, AT&T uh, office building that was built by the NSA, where the AT&T uh, hard, hard drives and its mainframes were connected into another like um, apparatus that the CIA was having, which was running all the cable of everybody's phone calls and signals uh, capabilities. It was run right through the NSA. And all that information went into a building called the Utah Data Center, which is located in Pine Buff, Utah. And all your emails and phone calls and text messages stored here. What for? Forever. So I would say that the intelligence services had the capabilities to protect us, but for whatever reason, didn't pre-9-11. And to me, this is the whole crux of 9-11, is pre-intelligence 9-11. And if you take a look at any of my breakdown videos, if you take a look at any videos uh, uh, regarding the CIA and the NSA pre-9-11, you will know that I harp on this consistently because this is the nexus of what ha is happening before 9-11 and after 9-11, more importantly. Because what we're living under are the ripple effects of the intelligence failures pre-9-11. I think we are um, independent. I think it's a combination of the two, sir. Or have the assets that we really need. Have the assets that we really need as function of assets that we really need as function of resources and people. 
We have to put the trainers in place. We have you to put the right it. kind of people here. We have to do much. You, you had the apparatus. You had it. There was no operation bigger than the bin Laden operation after the East Africa embassy bombings. The entire world was concentrated. This is, you know, this is the conspiracy regarding the intelligence services is that they'll complain that they didn't have the manpower, that they didn't have the resources. They did, because the only thing they were concentrating on from 1998 forward was bin Laden and Al Qaeda. So much so that the CIA's DCI, the Director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet, um, proclaimed that they were at war with Al Qaeda. This was brought up in the Joint House Inquiry by Carl Levin, no less. So the entire apparatus of the domestic agencies inside the United States, the FBI, the DIA, the CIA, the NSA, and foreign intelligence like Israel and Saudi Arabia, our allies who were conducting illegal operations inside the United States, who gave them the authorization? And if they didn't have authorization, why weren't they arrested when they were detained? They had an enormous intelligence operation on these operatives who were inside the United States, who were involved with 9-11. 9-11 should have never have happened. Much, much more, I hate to say this, this, this won't sound very clever, of what we're doing already. And then we get people out there and produce. I don't want to minimize the relationship with others. Well, my last comment was, yes, and again, thank you for the chair's forbearance. If given a blank check, how long would it take? Blank check. Be speculation, sir. Um, I can give, you know, it depends what type of comprehensive defense you're looking for. They'll never be 100%. So you could give me everything and I can't get 100%. But you have to, it would go down something from there. Yeah, and that's, you know, look, you know, the whole problem with these congressional hearings is that it wasn't that they didn't ask the right questions, is what they allowed these people to get away with. And you hear the word justice, or you hear the word um, morals, for example, uh, accountability which is even a better word. And for them, especially with the CIA, for them to basically not face any repercussions for this, and I'll use this term because it won't have, you won't even have the, enough validity behind it. For them to not face any accountability for their monumental, magnificent, failure of epic proportions when they could have stopped this from happening, when they didn't share the information and it's intentional withholding. And how the 9-11 truth movement is not behind this is unbelievable to me. And maybe that's the reason why starting in 2001 and 2002, that the initial Fringe conspiracies of no hijackers and fake planes and fake phone calls, which whitewashed the real conspiracy, the crux that was raised in commission hearings like this in regards to allowing these operatives not only to exist abroad, but to exist inside the United States, knowing they were here and told no one while Saudi Arabia and Israel were running their own intelligence operations, collecting as much information they did regarding these 9-11 operatives. What did they collect? We'll never know because we deported them all back to their home countries. Do you think they're going to be here facing uh, congressional inquiries and interviews? No. And so these fringe conspiracies continue to exist and they hold down the truth movement from ever investigating people like Kofor Black, for example, who barely even know he exists.
And here it is, the biggest intelligence failure in U.S. history right here. And Kofi Black will have you uh, believe that the real reason was because they lacked manpower. No. The question is, why, when they had enough information, why they didn't prevent it when they could?